Hello, welcome. My name is Miguel Nevis. And I'm Jennifer Spear. And if you're looking for GMID Goes Virtual, you're in the right place. We're counting down to GMID Goes Virtual, which starts in just under 30 minutes now. And if you're wondering what GMID Goes Virtual is, it is a grassroots virtual event uniting the industry and an attempt at the Guinness World Records title for the largest audience for a virtual conference. And if you want to help us break that record, you're going to have to stay on for the entire program. So once we go live, we need you to stay on for 30 minutes in order for you to count towards that record. Absolutely. And I am so excited because I know that when I was a kid, I used to take out the Guinness World Records books out of the library, the annual records books. And I remember reading about all the records all around the world. So this is a pretty special moment for me. Yeah, absolutely. It's so exciting. And there's so many interesting records, aren't there, Miguel? Um, I've always absolutely. been partial to the odd ones, you know, the longest fingernails or the longest mustache. Absolutely. There's some pretty special records out there. So um, glad you could join us here at GMID Goes Virtual. And I want to introduce a few of the uh, associations and organizations that have actually supported us in this amazing effort. So the first speaker that I want to introduce is Alison Batres from COCAL, La Federación de Identidades de Organizadores de Congresos y Afines de América Latina. Thank you, Allison. And if you're just joining us, you are watching GMID Goes Virtual. I'm Jennifer Spear. And I'm Miguel Nevis. And we're counting down to GMID Goes Virtual, which starts in just over 27 minutes now. Now you still got time to invite others. So we ask that you do go send them to gmidgoesvirtual.com slash join, or you can just use the share button up in the right hand corner and instantly share the link through Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Absolutely. Share, share, share. Just click that share button and share this link to as many people as you can. We need as many people watching as we can. And when you go onto the stream, you just have to sign in with your email address. That's just so we have the uh, email so that we can go for the record. So please do that. If you're on social media, please use the hashtag GMID goes virtual to post on social media. We'd love to see what you look like. Maybe just take a selfie of you watching this uh, event. That would be really amazing. We'd love to see those messages come through on social media using that hashtag GMID goes virtual. Fantastic. Now, um, remember to dress in layers because you know that the temperature can fluctuate within your living room and we want you to be comfortable for the entire show. Absolutely. Once again, I just wanted to introduce another of the organizations that has helped us bring this together uh, with us in a short video message. Next is David Dubois, the president and CEO of IAE, which is the International Association of Exhibitions and Events. Texas, USA. The IA team is working remotely and I'm in constant contact with them so that we can be of service and assistance to you. We all have immediate issues that we are focusing on, but we also know that as we move through this challenging opportunities that we have, that the sun will come out and we will move forward as a very strong and resilient industry. None of us are alone in this. So please stay safe and healthy 
and follow the guidelines in your local communities and your uh, cities, countries, states, and provinces so that we can move quickly into a recovery mode where all of us will be, once again, very successful in the exhibitions and events industry. Thank you and take care. Thank you, David. Now you're watching the pre-show for GMID Goes Virtual. I'm Jennifer Spear. And I am Miguel Neves. GMID Goes Virtual starts in just over 24 minutes now. And you might have noticed that on your screen right now, there's a word cloud forming. We'd love for you to tell us where you're watching from. And the way you can do that is through a tool called Slido. Very easy to use. If you have a mobile device with you, just scan that QR code that you see there and that'll go take you straight to the poll or open up another window in your browser and go to slido.com and type in that hashtag GMID goes virtual and tell us which country you're joining us from so we can see those countries on that big word cloud. Oh, you can see Canada's in the house and that's where I'm from as well. Hello, bonjour. Absolutely. Canada. Olá, Portugal. Como estão? Tudo bem? So make sure you add your country there. Make sure if you see a big word out there with your country, then make sure you add the same so that it can grow. Canada's in the lead right now, but I know there's people watching from all over the world. And of course, if you're on social media, don't forget to use that hashtag GMID goes virtual to share uh, what you're doing right now and to tell us that you're watching. So we want to talk, we want to introduce another short video message from another one of the organizations that have supported this event. And next we have Sentil Gopinath, the CEO of ICA, which is the International Congress and Convention Association. Our friends from all over the world. Greetings and it's indeed a pleasure to be part of this world record attempt. We stand together while we are apart so it's a fantastic concept and we should all should be part of it and virtual meetings are here to stay but I'm sure when when we have face-to-face -face meetings will become much more stronger. Let's get together show our support to our communities our friends and families and show the strength of our industry and also, most important to prove that we are one world and we are one community. Thank you very much. Wish you all the best. Thank you, Fentil. And if you're just joining us, we you are at GMID Goes Virtual. I'm Jennifer Spear. And I am Miguel Nevish. We are counting down. We're just over, tw just under 22 minutes away from the start of the event, the GMID Goes Virtual event. This is the pre-show. And if you're wondering what GMID Goes Virtual is, it is a grassroots virtual event aimed at uniting the industry. And also it's an attempt at the Guinness World Records title for the largest audience for a virtual conference. And we want you to help us get that record. And so that means you're going to have to stay on now until the end of the show. So once we start, stay on for the full 30 minutes because we want to make sure that you count towards the record. Absolutely, Jen. And we were talking earlier about famous Guinness World Record title holders. And, you know, I looked through a few of the more unusual ones that you were mentioning earlier. And I found one that I thought, you know, maybe just wins, the, wins it for me, which is the most toothpicks in a beard. Then can you guess how many toothpicks someone has had in their beard? I, I can't even imagine how to guess, but I can bet it all started with a beer and a bat. Absolutely. The answer is three and a half thousand. If you can imagine a man's beard with three and a half thousand toothpicks, that is one of the records in that book. That is amazing. And did you know just last week, a 10 year old girl won a record? and it was for stretching the longest bit of homemade slime. So you're never too young to realize your dream. Absolutely, and we know that Guinness World Records is actually running a special uh, feature now for people to break records from home. So we're kind of doing that ourselves right now. So it's very, very exciting, or at least attempting to. 
Um, so we could not really have done this without the support of various organizations and associations and global associations. So next we want to share a short message from Jen Glynn, the president of SITE, the Society for Incentive Travel Excellence. Happy Gemini ID Day from all your friends at SITE from around the world. In these uncertain times, it is more important than ever to connect, stay connected to our event industry family. We are keeping all those infected by the coronavirus in our thoughts and prayers, and we encourage you to stay positive until we can meet again face to face. Thanks for that message, Jen. And if you're just joining us, you are at GMID Goes Virtual. And I'm Jennifer Spear. And I am Miguel Neves. And we're counting down to the actual event, the GMID Goes Virtual, which starts in under 19 minutes now. We're almost there. Yeah, we want to make sure that you invite others. There's still time. So you can send them to gmidgoesvirtual.com slash join or you could just use the share button up in the right hand corner and instantly share the link through Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Now make sure if everybody brings one person, we know for sure we could crush this record. Absolutely, and if you share this feed, there is no need to go and register. There's no need to go back to the page and register. Just go straight into the feed, enter your email, and you count for the record, which is exactly what we want. And make sure if you're on social media, use the hashtag GMID goes virtual to post where you are, what you're doing. Maybe you have a nice coffee or maybe a glass of champagne. We never know. Uh, please share that. We'd love to see that. We've already received a few shout outs on social media. So I just wanted to mention, I know that people watching in the MPI feed, MPI gave us a shout out. Thank you very much, MPI. Rude Jensen is on all the social media channels shouting about the event. Thank you so much, Rude. Karen Verzma from Ottawa, Canada is giving a shout out to her for sharing on social media. Constance Wrigley is also sharing on social media. Terry Nielsen from Edmonton, Alberta, and Paul Colston and the crew from MASH Media. Big shout out to all of you. That's fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, let people know what you're doing. I mean, you're a part of history. You want to share that. Hashtag GMID goes virtual. Absolutely. And um, so, as we've been sharing a few already, I want to share another video from one of the associations that supported this event so far. And next up, we have a short video message from Ori Lav, the president of IAPCO, which is the International Association of Professional Congress Organizers. My name is Ori Lav, President of IAPCO, the International Association of Professional Congress Organizers. Now, more than ever, in these challenging times, we need to support one another. We all need to be more flexible, more adaptable, and dynamic. This will help us navigate this boat to safe harbor. Our industry is united more than ever. We all support GMID Live today. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Ori. And if you're just joining us, we are GMID Goes Virtual, and my name is Jennifer Spear. And I'm Miguel Neves, and uh, GMID Goes Virtual starts in just over 15 minutes. Now, you may have seen on your screen that there is a word cloud forming, and we'd love to know which country you're watching us from. Where are you right now? And in order to contribute to that word cloud, you're using, we're using a tool called Slido. You can use a mobile device and just scan that QR code that you see in the top left, or open up a new tab on your browser and go to slido.com and enter the hashtag, GMID goes virtual. That's wonderful. And Canada and the US are coming close. So we need to get some more Canadians in the house because that's where I'm calling from now. Miguel, whereabouts are you located? 
I'm in Denmark right now in Copenhagen and I can see Denmark also on the list. I can see Germany, Mexico pretty big, Malaysia, you know, big hello to everybody out there. I'm going to try and say hello in Malay. Lamat Petang. I hope that was not a terrible pronunciation. Hello to also the Dutch friends out there. Hello, guten Abend. I hope that you're enjoying that. Next up, we have another video from um, some of the people that have joined us. In this case, it's a message from China. Thank you very much for China for all the support that you gave this event. Uh, next up, video from China for you. I'm Alicia Yao, Sai Global uh, Board Director from China. China now is recovering from COVID-19, and I hope the whole world is going to recover soon. And meeting means business. I hope our meeting industry re recover and our business will come back, uh, which will definitely improve the whole economy uh, of the world. And let's win together. Sebagai industri, kita perlu bersatu walaupun kita berjauhan. I'm Ashwin from Ica Asia Pacific Chapter. Let's stand together when we are far apart. Même si nous sommes loin des uns des autres, soyons solidaires. Ensemble, nous vaincrons le virus. Thank you for that message. And if you're just joining us, we are GMID Goes Virtual. My name is Jennifer Spear. And I am Miguel Nevis. And uh, we're counting down to GMID Goes Virtual, which is going to start in just over 13 minutes now. We're almost there. If you're wondering what GMID Goes Virtual it's all about, well, it's a grassroots virtual event on GMID, the Global Meetings Industry Day, designed to unite the industry. And it's also an attempt at the Guinness World Records title for the largest audience for a virtual conference. Now, because we're going after the world record, we need you to stay on board with us until, in, right until the end. So as soon as the show starts, we need you to stay on for 30 minutes because we want you to count towards that record. Absolutely. And I'm a big fan of the Guinness World Records ever since I was a kid. And I remember reading about man, Ashrita Furman, and he is the person with the most Guinness World Record titles in history. He actually set 700 records and currently holds 200 records, which is absolutely amazing. It's just incredible. And I was reading about the different records that he has and um, real diverse. So from balancing a chainsaw on his chin for the longest time to doing the most jumping jacks, 20 7,000 jumping jacks in a row. It took six hours and 45 minutes. Now we as event professionals are pretty flexible and adaptable, but that really, you know, takes the record. Absolutely. So quick shout out on social media. We know we have Kyle Hillman watching, Brett Culp, we may see a little bit more of him later. And also John and Carla Andrasik are watching right now. Hello to you. And we want to have, we want to play for you another quick video message from one of the supporting associations that really made this happen. Next up, we have Paul Vandeventer, the president of C and CEO of MPI. Meeting Professionals International. Greetings, business event community. Hello, this is Paul Van Deventer, President and CEO of Meeting Professionals International. As we gather today virtually in this time of crisis, to celebrate Global Meetings Industry Day, I encourage you to look to the future. History has demonstrated that working together as a community, as an industry, and as a society, we will pull out of this situation, and we'll pull out of it stronger and more vibrant than ever. I look forward to that time when we can all gather together again and reunite to celebrate the recovery of our industry. Because when we meet, we change the world. So until then, please be safe, and be well. Take care. Thank you for that message, Paul. 
And if you're just joining us, this is GMID Goes Virtual, the pre-show. My name is Jennifer Spear. And I'm Miguel Neves, and we're counting down to GMID Goes Virtual, which starts in 10 minutes. We're almost there. Uh, so you want to invite others. We still have time. You want to send them to gmidgoesvirtual.com slash join. Or you could use the share buttons up in the corner, and that'll instantly share the link through Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Absolutely. And when you join, you just have to enter your email address, and you'll come straight into this feed. We hope you do that. If you're on social media, please use the hashtag GMIDGoesVirtual. We'd love to see your pets. We'd love to meet the four-legged furry friends that are part of your life or any other types of pets that you have. Really make them GMID Goes Virtual Pets. We'd love to see those images come through on social media. So please share. Absolutely. Make sure you let everybody know where you are right now that you are going to be part of history and break a record and then invite them to come. If everybody invites one person, we will crush this. Absolutely. And you know, just like with any virtual event, clothes are optional. We don't want to know exactly what's going on there. So, uh, you know, just, just keep it to yourselves, but make sure you're comfortable for the next while because we want to make sure you stay all the way through. And, and some of the associations and organizations that have made this possible, one of them is PCMA. And we have a short message for, for you from PCMA, from Sheriff Karamat, the president of CEO of the association PCMA, which was previously known as the Professional Convention Management Association. If there is one thing I would like you to take away from GMIT, it is this. The Chinese characters for crisis are the same as those for opportunity. I believe within the, the most dire days of this crisis lies opportunities for our industry and for us. As challenging as today may seem, it is a wake-up call for all of us on the need to pursue our opportunities for a brighter tomorrow. Simply put, we need to meet differently. Now is our time, our time to be courageous and take action so that our business events can truly transform the world economically and socially when it is most needed. We can do this. Together, we will do this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheriff. And if you're just joining us, this is GMID Goes Virtual. My name is Jennifer Spear. And I am Miguel Neves, and GMID Goes Virtual starts in just about six and a half minutes. You may have noticed just below that counter, we have a word cloud coming up, and this is a poll really asking you, what country are you watching us right now from? So we'd love for you to add your contribution there as well. We're using a tool called Slido. You don't have to download an app or anything like that. The easiest way to do this is to take your phone and scan that QR code that you see on the screen. That'll take you straight to the poll or open up a new tab on your browser and go to slido.com and enter the hashtag GMID goes virtual. So we have a hello, bonjour, to everybody there today. Hi, hi Denmark, Vodan Gore. To our Greek friends, Yasas, Kalispera. To our Arab friends, Assalamu alaikum. And to and all of the Canadians know... out there, how are you doing, eh? <laughs> all right. And also we know that our friends from China, they're, they're having a little bit of difficulty logging into the, um, the stream. We apologize for that. We're looking into it, but please stay with us. And I know it's quite late in China, so I just wanted to say Wong Shanghao. 
I hope I pronounced that okay. So next up, we have one more message or uh, yeah, this is the last message actually from one of the associations and organizations that are supporting us. Next, a short video message from Dana McCauley, the president-elect of ILEA International, the International Live Events Association. Greetings, virtual GMI dears. This is Dana McCauley, CSEP, ILEA International President-Elect, coming to you from the safety of my own home here in Sonoma County, California. Global Meetings Industry Day is such an incredible day for our community. And even though this year we'll have to live entirely in the virtual realm, I have no doubt the conversations here will be dynamic, informative, and educational. On behalf of the entire ILEA International Leadership Team and our 3,000 plus members worldwide, many of whom are here on this call today, we want to say a huge thank you to the organizers of GMID Goes Virtual. Good luck from all of us in the record-breaking attempt today, and thank you for all you're doing to keep us connected. Cheers, everyone. Thank you for that message, Dana. And if you're just joining us, this is GMID Goes Virtual. And I am Jennifer Spear. And I am Miguel Neves. And we're counting down to GMID Goes Virtual, which is just over three minutes away. I can't wait. If you're wondering what GMID Goes Virtual is, it is a grassroots virtual event uniting the industry and an attempt at the Guinness World Records title for the largest audience for a virtual conference. And we need your help to reach this. So that means once you're logged in, you have to stay logged in for the entire time. So we need you on there once we start for 30 minutes because we want you to count towards the record. Absolutely. And if you're on the feed, make sure you press that share button top right of your screen. Share, get everybody to join in. The more the merrier. We really, we really welcome everybody at this event. And when you join, just enter your email address. We need that to make sure that the records are straight for the Guinness uh, representatives and the witnesses. And if you're on social media, please use the hashtag GMID goes virtual. Post where you're watching from. I want to do a few shout outs here. I saw Dahlia posted. Dahlia El Ghazar posted a picture of her pet and how she's watching. Hey Dahlia, hope you're doing well. We have Donna Jarvis Miller in Alexandria. Big shout out. Sam Allen watching from London. Kate Peterson from Chicago. Teresa Gatto from Ottawa, Canada, and Susan Prophet from Quebec City. Big shout outs to everybody for sharing on social media. We love seeing those images come in, so please keep sending them over. Absolutely, this is getting excited. We're just two minutes away from the start, so please invite someone else to join us. If everybody brings one, then we can get this record. So it's gmidgoesvirtual.com slash join or use the share buttons up in the top right hand corner. Absolutely. We can see people from all over the world. Hola, Guatemala. E aí, Brasil, tudo bem? Thank you for watching us from Brazil and uh, Mexico, France, India, Ireland. The whole world is represented here. We really appreciate you joining us. Hello, hola. Now, Jen, do you want to tell, explain a little bit of what Global Meetings Industry Day for is for, for anybody who's watching that maybe is not familiar with GMID? Yeah, so GMID stands for Global Meetings Industry Day, and it is the day where every event professional from around the world gathers to celebrate and recognize and advocate for the meetings and events industry. And this year is no different. We're just going to be doing it virtually. And so it's been so exciting to, to be here and to have this event with everybody, with the thousands of the meeting professionals around the world. We want to thank you for joining us. Absolutely. We're just about to start. Don't forget, in this poll, you can enter which country you're watching us from. Please do that now. We have a few more polls later on, so give it a practice. Why not? And uh, share on social media. Use the hashtag GMID Goes Virtual. Share where you're watching from. Share your pets. Share what drink you're having. I'm just having a little bit of water right now. We'd love to hear from you on social media. 
We're very, very close now, Jen. The countdown is coming up quick. I know I'm excited, but definitely post. You want people to know where you were when we made history. So share it away. Hello and welcome to GMID Goes Virtual. My name is Jennifer Spear. And I'm Miguel Neves. Welcome, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world. We want to start by sending you a huge virtual hug. We know this is a difficult time, but a big, big, warm virtual hug to all of you around the world. We want to welcome you to GMID and connect with the global industry and you are here and that is so important and it's important for you to stay on with us for the entire time so now that you're here stay with us for 30 minutes because we want to make sure that you count towards the record and before we get into today's program we'd like to take a moment to show our appreciation for all the medical and healthcare staff all around the world they are our heroes right now and so we're posting a short message on social media from our team Please share that or, you know, to show your appreciation. We'd really think that that's a great thing that you can do right now. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how we got here. And it's quite an interesting story. On March the 13th, it was announced that the regular uh, Global Meetings Industry Day live events were no longer taking place. And Anne Nguyen tweeted this. Maybe for GMID this year, we should just try to break the world record for the largest virtual meeting ever held. How many event profs can we get online in an online meeting? Everyone just shares their favorite thing about working in this amazing industry. And who better than Anne herself to tell us how this all came to be? Hi, everyone. My name's Anne, and I'm from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, where do I even start? The whole GMID Goes Virtual concept started with a tweet I put out on March 13th, which, believe it or not, was only two weeks ago. Um, it came on the heels of me realizing that Global Meetings Industry Day events around the world were being cancelled, including the awesome one that we were planning in Calgary. GMID has always been about celebrating our industry and our community, and it was just so devastating to think that we'd have to postpone it this year. So I put out a crazy tweet randomly suggesting that we turn GMID into a huge virtual world record-breaking event, and I've been so completely humbled and inspired by the leaders, uh, industry associations and organizations that have come on board to support the initiative. Um, but then once I got to thinking about it, I realized that of course I shouldn't be surprised. The meetings and events industry is made up of the most resilient, tenacious, um, resourceful and dedicated individuals that I've ever worked with. Um, so of course we're gonna rally together to show the world that even though we've been knocked down and we've been knocked down bad. Um, we're still gonna go do what we do best. We're still gonna connect, we're gonna meet, we're still gonna collaborate and celebrate. And when the time comes that we can do that all in the same room, we're gonna come back stronger and better than ever. And now here we are. We had over 13,000 people register for this event online and we have over 7,000 watching live right now. All of this to me is a clear sign of the amazing strength and resiliency of our industry. We also appreciate the support of all the partners and we'd like to give a special shout out to IAE, ILEA, PCMA and SITE, not only for helping us promote the event, but also for helping us cover some of the financial costs. Now, we know this event couldn't have happened without them and definitely it wouldn't have been able to happen without the support of the Meetings Means Business Coalition. So Meetings Means Business Coalition represents and advocates for the meetings and event professionals across our industry. And today we have representatives from Meetings Means Business Canada, US, India, and Mexico. And I would like to introduce Clark Gray the chair of Meetings Mean Business Canada. Thank you, Jennifer and Miguel. And great job warming us up, by the way. That was a lot of fun. I want to thank the uh, committee as well, of over 50 people around the world who have organized this amazing event for us today. Hello, world. 
As chair of Meetings Mean Business Canada, it's a real pleasure to be part of this incredible Guinness Book of World Records attempt. I am so proud to be part of this resilient industry. I'm joined today by Chair of Meetings Mean Business India, Nitin Sachdeva, Co-Chair Meetings Mean Business Mexico, Jaime Salazar, and Co-Chair of Meetings Mean Business US, Fred Dixon. I want to say a very special welcome to all of you that are not event professionals, maybe wondering why you're here and, and why your family member prodded you to get in here today. You may not organize events, but I'm sure that you've attended them and you can appreciate what this audience does on a daily basis to make amazing events happen. Canada, as many of your countries around the world, is in a state of shutdown from a business meetings point of view. Most provinces here are not allowing meetings of more than 15, and in some cases that number is as low as five. The government here is working hard to flatten the curve and restore health stability in our country, as I'm sure they are in yours. Also, they have introduced programs and made funding available for small businesses and families during the crisis. But even during these difficult times, Canadian convention centers and hotels are stepping up and becoming temporarily converted into hospitals or housing projects to help support those who need assistance or simply need space for social distancing. We're really looking forward to the recovery of our economy and welcoming meeting delegates back to Canada as soon as the fall of 2020. And we all look forward to our industry coming back on its feet very soon. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Nitin in India. Thank you, Clark. Uh, hello everyone from the global meetings industry. It's a historic moment where the world is under lockdown and here we are together online to support each other and showcase our love and passion for the industry. Thank you so much for joining in. India's meeting industry stands with the global industry peers. And as the government in India and around the world are doing a wonderful job by taking monumental decisions to find, fight this pandemic, I hope our industry can hold their feet together and come up back stronger than ever before. I would like to end with a positive note that this was a needed pause for a greater push. Stay safe and healthy. Over to Jaime from Mexico. Thank you so much, Nini. Hello, everybody. Greetings from Mexico. I am Jaime Salazar, the chairman of the MMB in Mexico, and I am really excited to be here with all of you to try to break this uh, Guinness World Record for a meetings like this. But let me, let me tell you something. I'm even more excited to let you know that in spite of the sanitary emergency, all Mexican meetings industry professionals are still gathering. Now, thanks to the technology, since Mexico is entering the phase two of the virus spread and therefore we are all locked down. And we're still meeting because when we meet, we are stronger and we can keep sharing ideas, innovations, training, amongst many things. We wish you to stay healthy, to stay strong, because we want to meet you soon, very soon, of course, in Mexico. Now, I'll pass to my colleague in New York City, Fred Dixon. Thank you so much, Jaime. I want to start out by giving a huge thanks to Anne and Clark and the Meetings Mean Business Canada team for putting this all together. And thank you to every one of you for joining us here today. I'm Fred Dixon, President and CEO of NYC and & Company and Co-Chair of Meetings Means Business here in the US. It is my honor to be with you and I uh, share greetings from my co-chair, Trina Camacho London of Hyatt Hotels. It goes without saying, this is an extraordinary moment for our industry and for humanity itself. The devastating effects of COVID-19 are changing our reality and testing our resolve at every turn. Now, the U.S. Travel Association predicts 5.9 million travel-related jobs will be lost by the end of April. And the Center for Exhibition Industry Research predicts 14 to $22 billion will be lost to the U.S. economy due to trade shows and event cancellations alone. Each passing day reminds us why coming together face-to-face -to -face is even more valuable than we ever knew. Now, while the challenge before us is definitely daunting, and we are gonna to have to learn to meet differently, we remain more committed than ever to our recovery. The Meetings Mean Business Coalition is working with government at every level to secure vital economic support for business and industry workers. For me and my colleagues, COVID-19 has hit hard and close to home here in New York City. I am, however, comforted by the conversations of hope and acts of goodwill by industry professionals and students here in our local community and around the globe. These stories are what we want to spotlight today with GMED Virtual, to highlight how meeting and event professionals are making a difference 
by doing what we do best, uniting around a common cause. If you have donated products or donated service to help with relief efforts in your community, we encourage you to visit meetingsmeanbusiness.com slash commit, the number two, community, to share your story. To all the meeting and event professionals who continue to show resolve and fortitude, we salute you and we stand with you in navigating this crisis and coming out the other side stronger and more determined. Please stay strong, as my colleagues have said. Please stay well. We will absolutely meet again. Back to you, Clark. Thank you, Fred, and Jaime and Nitin for all those great, great remarks from your part of the world. It's so great to be part of a global Meetings Mean Business Coalition. For those of you that know me, you know that I'm passionate about business events driving not only tourism activity, but also economic development and economic stimulation. Business events should be and will be one of the key catalysts towards economic recovery as we emerge, emerge from the other side of the COVID-19 crisis. And each of you will play a significant role in the reemergence of our industry as it grows back to the $1 trillion level that it has been globally over the past five years. Now I'd like to hand it back to Miguel. Thank you so much, Clark, and to all the Meetings Mean Business Coalition representatives. And thank you for watching us. I have just been told that there's over 10,000 people watching right now, over 10,000 event professionals around the world with us, which is absolutely amazing. So for the next few minutes, we're going to be creating one of the largest data sets on the meetings and events industry ever assembled. And this was hopefully gonna help you and us paint a picture of what is happening right now in the meetings industry globally. For this, we're using a tool called Slido. This is the same tool that you used in the pre-show. So if you've already used it in the pre-show, there's nothing to do. I think over 2,000 people used it in the pre-show. So we're hoping to increase that number, get all 10,000 people using Slido. Just a few quick instructions. On the screen that's gonna come up, you will see a QR code. You can just take a mobile device and scan that QR code, and that will take you right into the poll. Just use your camera app or whatever you're using. If you wanna use a computer, just open up a different tab, go to slido.com and enter the event hashtag, which is GMID goes virtual. Now I am so excited to be collecting this data in this moment live with this audience and for everyone to have a ch chance to have their voice heard. Now, we want to find out who we've got on the line here. We know that this industry is very diverse and there's all kinds of different aspects of it. But our first question is we're going to ask you, um, what is your primary role in the industry? Now, I know event professionals often wear many hats, but what is your primary role? How would you describe yourself? Um, I know I identify as a speaker. Uh, how about you, Miguel? Myself as well. I think I identify as a speaker, although I've been a planner in the past and I've worked for trade show organizations. So I've done a bit of everything, but at the moment, that's where I would go. And thank you so much for everybody replying. I can see already that we have two and a half, 2,600 replies already. Keep pressing, just choose your option. And at the bottom of your phone, just press send to make sure that your answer counts for the for the full number there. That's what it, we definitely have some planners in the house. Absolutely. We have, I'd say, a majority of planners at the moment. I'm seeing 54% planners at the moment, which is amazing. But, you know, no matter what, where you sit or, you know, what you do in the industry, I hope that this poll not only gives us some information, but also makes you see that you're not alone, that there is comfort in seeing so many other people that share similar roles to you, uh, you know, on this call right now and participating in this event. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, still over half half is uh, our planner so that's great absolutely so we're at 5500 roughly responses which means that there's probably 2600 2700 planners on the phone right now watching us live not on the phone but live on the stream that's absolutely amazing so I think we just want to make sure we give you enough time to reply I can see that the, the amount of people replying are, are going down so I'm going to move on and we don't just want to have a demographic view of what's happening right now. We want to make sure that um, that that we understand how you're feeling, and and, and so we want we want to do a, a an open question so you can enter whatever you want. But the question really is, in one word, how are you feeling right now? And we want you to go with your gut feeling. 
not really overthink it about you know this whole period just how are you feeling tell us because hopefully this is going to be a little bit therapeutic and and there's power in being together and honest together yeah and it's okay to have different feelings i mean we can feel differently during this what we're all experiencing from day to day or even within the same day we'll find uh, that we're feeling a little bit differently and uh, some of us um, as humans we, we really do want to be optimistic and hopeful but it's okay um, if you're feeling a little uncertain a little anxious in this uncertainty that's absolutely totally normal but what i'm hoping that this demonstrates is that you're not alone uh, we are in this together and I do believe we will get out of this together. Absolutely. We're seeing anxious and hopeful really taking the lead there, but some great words, optimistic, love seeing that, stressed, tired, sad. Yep, those are all parts of the parts, feelings that I felt as well, uh, nervous, uh, but also great things uh, coming up there. So thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah, for me, my word is inspired and it's from working with this group, it has just been an incredible experience putting this all together. So if I could type while I talked, I would put in inspired. Absolutely. We're seeing great, grateful, blessed, curious, concerned, a mix of emotions. Really, thank you so much for contributing. We have over 6,000 responses now. Oh, that's wonderful. And, you know, in all of the conversations we've been having over the last few weeks, the, the one question that always seems to come up is when do we get to go back and have a live physical event again? And so our next question is asking you within your calendar, what is the earliest live event that you have in your calendar? Now, this could be an event that you're planning, that you're participating in or that you're attending. So we just want to see what we have here. And we see that September is coming up strong. And recognizing we have people here from around the world and different regions are being impacted differently. So we have some areas that are coming out of um, the pandemic earlier than others. So we will see some changes here. So we do see some earlier ones. We have June with a high level, um, but September, that is a strong month. Absolutely. And make sure it's not just for planners, this poll. So even if you're just attending events or if you're a speaker, just let us know when is the next thing that's really booked next live event in person event that's booked on your calendar. I think we have 5000, you know, five and a half thousand almost people responding. September seems to be really strong, followed by August, June and July. So it looks like there's still a lot of events happening in the summer period. So I, for one, think that's really, really great to see. That's exciting. So if you've just joined this, you may have missed the instructions. I want to make sure we get as many answers as we, as we get. So we're using a tool called Slido. There's nothing to download. All you have to do if you have a mobile phone is you can scan that QR code that you see top left and it will go straight into uh, the poll. You can use a camera app on your phone or go to a new tab or new window on your browser. Type in Slido.com and use the hashtag GMID goes virtual and add your contribution to the poll. Wow, we had over 6,000 people contributing to that poll. Thank you so much. Now, the next thing we want to get into is understanding the trend of events going online. And just like this event, which was, you know, hundreds of events all around the world, and there's many events going on online today for GMID, we wanted to understand this shift from planned events live events for 2020 that have gone virtual or online. So the question we have for you is what portion, you know, of your previously planned events for 2020, what portion has gone virtual or online? And the options range from none, 0%, all the way to all. And then there's a few options in between. So we're not looking for an exact number, but maybe your kind of feeling of, oh, everything that you had planned, again, attending or planned as a planner, which of the you know what portion has gone online now we're meeting here on gmid and originally there were a lot of live events planned and now we are a hundred percent virtual this year and i gotta say for myself i'm having a great time absolutely and we heard in the news recently that microsoft announced that all their events will be digital only until july 2021 so we're definitely seeing a big shift in this direction but let's see what the poll tell us 
it, the, the winner really is a small portion and none also comes up pretty strong. So this shift towards virtual is, you know, from what the polls are telling us, it's not necessarily a given. There is a small portion or, you know, a very small portion going online or virtual. Well, that remains to be seen. We'll see what the next few months uh, have in store for us. That's fantastic. And, and that's with almost six, oh, just over 6,000 people responding. That's fantastic information. Wonderful. Now, it's not just these big events that are going virtual, but I know if you're like me, you've had lots of virtual meetings and video meetings and video conferences over the last few weeks. And as you're looking at everybody's picture around, you're wondering the same thing I am. Are they wearing pants? And so we want to ask you right now, if you are now, you've, we've got a couple of answers here for you to choose from, but I know what's on everybody's mind right now, Miguel. It's, are you, are you wearing pants? I can't show you, but I can guarantee that I am, guarantee you that I am wearing pants. I am cabled in, so it's a little hard to do. But, uh, you know, if you're not, that's okay too. That is the advantage of virtual and online events. Um, I, I have to say myself, though, I, I like dressing up for events. I like looking good at events. So I really look forward to going to events where pants are not optional. So next thing that we want to ask you to look at is really kind of take out your crystal ball and uh, help us forecast what events are going to look like once this crisis is over. So we're talking after the coronavirus pandemic, when it's over, what do you think it's going to look like? And we've given you a few options here, and I'm also answering the poll myself, but you know, we're really saying, you know, will there be a greater demand for live events? Is it going to be unchanged? So go back very much to the same thing. Will more events become hybrid? Or will there be a greater demand for virtual events? So, you know, we're forcing you to choose one. So give us your, your best guess there for what you think will happen next. And just to define hybrid, hybrid means that there is a live event, but there is also an online virtual component. And in some ways you can choose to travel to the live event or watch online. Yeah, now what's happening right now in the world has the potential to change our industry, but we also have the opportunity to define that together we can write the new script for our industry. Absolutely. And I think, you know, this is obviously, or, you know, not obvious, but it is an opportunity to reset. It's an opportunity to reconsider how events are designed and planned. And it may be also an opportunity to create new types of events. And I know there's hackathons going on and all sorts of things going on to really imagine or reimagine or really rethink what events can look like with this virtual and online side of things. It is exciting in many ways. And I just want to look at the poll quickly. We have almost 7,000 people responding, which is absolutely amazing. And overwhelmingly, currently 62% say that most events will become hybrid. So I think we're, you know, almost two thirds of us are thinking, you know, hybrid is really where we're going to go next, which is really, really interesting. It's very interesting in terms of being able to rethink how it is that we deliver our our experiences to our audience. I think uh, we're getting a lot of good practice in these few weeks, and so I think that's very exciting. Now, this will be over, it, it, it will. And what I wanna know is when this is over, what is the first thing that you want to do once the pandemic is over? Now, I know for me, I am so sick of my own cooking that I can't wait to go to a restaurant and I also want to go out and, and hear some music live. Um, how about you, Miguel? What is the first thing that you want to do? And again, we're asking you in one word, if you can, to build that word cloud. For me, it's to travel. Uh, and for a particular reason, I want to go see my mom. I think my mom is actually watching the feed. So if you're watching, hello, mom. And please help me in wishing my mom a happy birthday because it's her birthday. It's her 60th birthday today. So the first thing I want to do is give her a big hug. And I have to. I live in Copenhagen in Denmark, and I need to travel to Portugal to do that. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. But also I'm looking forward to connecting with all the volunteers that made this event happen. We essentially met online and we've been producing this event online. And I can't wait to have the opportunity to share a drink and, and give everybody a hug who's been part of this team. Oh, well, happy birthday, mom. And I can't wait, Miguel, to click a, a glass or, or two with you when this is all over. 
Me too. And we can see in the poll, travel is really big. Family, friends, hug, restaurant, go out to eat, see family. There's, you know, there's definitely uh, that human connection that is missing of all of us right now. Thank you so much for watching. This is the last poll that we had for you, but it's not the end of the show. So stick around. Next up, we want to share with you a really special message from our friend Brett Culp. But don't go away because we're going to come back after the video. Over to you, Brett. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the stage. Mic one is live. Happy birthday! Stage light up. And now, please welcome, for the very first time, we're on in five, four, three. A hundred million moments. This is the canvas upon which you create. It's chaotic and competitive. It's layered and loud. And it carries on at a pace so fast that some days it seems unmanageable. A hundred million ideas. These are the tools of your art, making the unseen a reality. And so you create with to-do lists that go on forever. Endless revisions from clients who seem impossible to please. Running from one event to another with hardly a moment to take a breath or sleep in your own bed. Often thankless, often fleeting, sometimes forgotten. Through late nights in rooms lit only by the glow of your laptop. In boardrooms where no one else understands the majestic vision you see so clearly. In ballrooms where everyone rushes and rallies and refuses to slow down. And yet, my friends, it all matters. With your effort and your heart and your skill together, you envision events that become unforgettable memories for those who actually pause to witness and for those who just get lost in the moment. Though they may never know your name, countless people will experience inspiration, delight, and elegance because of your passion. In a time that can seem overwhelmed with darkness, you choose to showcase the glories to bring order to the chaos, to express the true flavor of being alive. You remind all of us, for just a few moments, of the beauty in ourselves. And you help us rekindle the light we've lost. In a world that seems to always destroy, you create. With careful focus and detail, you sculpt an experience with light and color movement and sound, taste and texture, you craft feelings and share ideas. You illuminate the art around us and within us that is so often missed. Your work adds to a tapestry of dreams, a canvas of creativity that brings into focus our celebrations and achievements and victories. Consider the collective brilliance gathered in this room today. The imagination represented in the hundred million moments that you have designed. Imagine the landscape ahead filled with wonder and magic and light. In your heart, pause with me right now to witness those hundred million moments. Then look with me into the next series of masterpieces that will be born because of your effort. And celebrate with me, dear friends, because this beauty matters. Thank you, Brett, for that very powerful message. Really a true virtual hug. And for those of you in uh, perhaps in difficult situations, if you have immediate financial needs, there are two organizations that we know of, there may be more, that may be able to help. So we wanted to mention these two organizations, and these are the Above and Beyond Foundation 
and the Search Foundation. You'll see the logos for them both on the screen and you'll find links to them on our website. Now, these are different from other foundations in the industry as they're really to help anybody with financial, immediate financial needs, they may be able to help. Um, of course, if you're in a position to donate, both of those foundations would be more than glad to take a donation. So if you're in a position to help those people in the most need, please do so. Well, thank you. We have loved celebrating GMID with you, and we hope that by gathering here together that you witness the power of this strong and resilient community. Um, and GMID is only one day, so we need to be able to take what happened here, take this energy and create something positive out of it. Um, we know that our industry is changing in ways that we do not yet understand. But we need to accept that offer and work together to write a new script for our industry. So to make sure that we uh, stay connected, one of the ways you can do that is go back to the GMID Goes Virtual website, www.gmidgoesvirtual.com, and there's a page there called What's Next. You click on that page, you will find the results of the polls that you've participated in. They will be in a few days. But there's also a separate poll there where you can add your ideas about what, uh, you know, how, sorry, how we can support the meetings and events industry moving forward and vote for the ideas that are there already. So if you have good ideas, just make sure that you add those in there and maybe those upvotes will bring your votes to the top. You'll also find the links to the two foundations mentioned before. Uh, and of course, I want to make sure we mention social media one more time. Uh, big shout outs to the other Michael Jackson watching from South Africa, Abby Cannons, Nick Borelli. I know also Ash Mashadi, John Rubensam, and Lisa Plackett. Thank you so much for sharing. But we have one more challenge for you, really, for social media. We wanted you to share also why you meet, why the meetings industry is so important to you, and what meetings really means to you. So if you're feeling creative, we challenge you to make a video or even a photo. And this example here on the screen is a photo collage that we thought was amazing. And just use the hashtag, why I meet. Tell your story because we know that we're not alone and there's so many great stories around the world and we'd love to hear from you. That's right. Now, this all started with a tweet, but it came together because of all of the amazing volunteers so we had over 50 volunteers that jumped on board and said, yes, we want to get involved with this and we want to be able to recognize them. It was such an incredible experience working with them, um, their knowledge and their, and their passion for this industry and for this event. Uh, they put in tons of hours and I think there was approximately 11,673 Slack messages and that might have just been in the last 24 hours. But it was absolutely wonderful working with them. And I thank each and every one of them. And I can't wait for us to meet in person. There's also a lot of organizations and associations that supported us in, in um, this effort. And so we have them all listed on the website. So please go to gmidgoesvirtual.com and you can see all of them listed there. Absolutely. We're almost coming to the end now. And I think the question on everybody's mind is, did we make it? Are we now Guinness World Record title holders? Well, here's the thing. We don't know. Um, and we won't know because we have to send our information to Guinness and they have to audit all of our information. So it's not official until they do so. But regardless, I think we should all be extremely proud of what we accomplished here in just a month. That tweet went out just a month ago and we all came together and created this event and thousands of people have come together uh, to accomplish this today. It is truly remarkable. Uh, now I know no one is gonna forget 2020, uh, but what I'm hoping is for the meetings and events industry that what we remember about 2020 is not what didn't happen, but what did, and that we came together to accomplish this together. Absolutely, Jen. I could not agree with you more. Now, what's going to happen now is immediately following this, we have the Meetings Mean Business Canada event. And our chair, Clark Gruy, is going to be interviewing the Minister of Economic Development and Official Languages. We are then going into an awesome industry panel where we are going to be discussing the industry 
the reality, the response, and the recovery. So you don't have to go anywhere for that. You can just stay on the same stream and we'll go directly into that channel. Now, there are a lot of GMID events going on today, and we want to thank you for taking time to spend with us. Absolutely. This concludes this event, and it's goodbye for me. It's been an absolute pleasure co-hosting this unique event with you, Jen. Our heartfelt thanks to everybody, especially to you watching, for being part of this virtual experience from everybody behind the scenes. And to wrap up our event, we have a special musical performance from Five for Fighting, which will lead us directly into the Meanings Means Business Canada event. We hope that we've inspired you to take action. And if you're not sure where to start, remember, just send out a tweet. You never know what might happen. Hey guys, this is John Androstic of Five for Fighting. Certainly thinking all of you who are uh, suffering from the fallout from this pandemic. I know uh, I lost a good friend, Neil Asher in New York City, to the COVID virus, uh, like so many people. But within the worst, we see the best. And uh, to all of you frontline emergency workers, doctors, nurses, checkers, postal officers, uh, we see the best of us in you. This song is Superman. joined us for the Canadian panel on business events. My name is Clark Gruy. I'm the CEO of Rainmaker Global Business Development and the 2020 Chair of Meetings Made Business Canada. As most of you are aware, we just came off the Guinness World Book of Records attempt 
at convening the largest online conference. And you will have heard Jennifer talk about the fact that we don't know yet, so don't ask. <laughs> we'll find out in the coming days um, how we did. But thank you so much for all of you that joined us um, on that attempt. And we're looking forward to finding out how we did. But at, at the end of the day, it was just great to see people from all over the world coming together um, and discussing uh, this very important industry. Um, I am extremely pleased to have with us today the Honorable Melanie Jolie, uh, Canadian Minister for Economic Development and Official Languages. Minister Jolie, thank you for being here with us today. I know that your schedule is crazy right now um, as your government leads us through this unique challenge that is ahead of us. And I know most of you out there know who Minister Jolie is um, from her extraordinary work to elevate the tourism industry here in Canada. She really has been our banner bearer for tourism uh, and official languages, and now has the critical role of Minister of Economic Development as well for Canada. So we're so pleased that we, uh, we were able to get Minister Jolie to join us for a little bit of time here today. Um, what you may not know uh, is that Minister Jolie holds an uh, Honours Bachelor of Law from the University of Montreal and a Magister Juris in European and Comparative Law from the University of Oxford. She's also the author of Changing the Rules of the Game, in which she shares her vision for public policy and civic engagement. And also, I thought this was very, very cool, she was also named a Young Global Leader by the World Economic you Forum. Were so I'm really, really excited about having Minister Jolie here with us um, and looking forward to giving, have, asking her some questions from the business events industry, but uh, also allowing Minister Jolie to just uh, open up with some remarks that will, will set the stage for, um, for our discussion together. And I'm presuming Minister Jolie is still there and with us. Yes, I am, Clark. I'm sorry, I think uh, I, the video didn't work, but I'm on the line. Excellent. Well, if, if you don't mind, Minister, I'll throw over to you and allow you to just share some thoughts. Perfect. Well, thank you all for attending this fantastic conference, and thank you, Clark and Jennifer, also and Miguel, for your leadership. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to present you a bit what's the reading of the federal government uh, right now of this situation? And uh, how can uh, we be helping you uh, as we're going through a, a very difficult economic and, and crisis and, and pandemic? Obviously, the first, uh, the, the first responsibility of the government is to keep Canadians uh, safe and healthy. And so uh, what we wanted to do very quickly was to make sure to work with public health authorities to uh, make sure that people would be following the public health uh, authorities' advice, and uh, that we would be all flattening that curve. And so our biggest economic uh, measure has been really uh, making sure we can flatten that curve and that, uh, that the pandemic, the spread of the virus be contained and that it doesn't last uh, as, you know, as long as it, it could be uh, lasting if that wasn't the case. Uh, so that's the first, first priority. Second priority was really to have a pe people's first approach, to uh, make sure that people, while following the strict measures of social distancing and physical distancing, would not be worried about being able to pay their rent or mortgages or even put food on the table. So that's why we decided to expand massively the social safety nets in, in the country. At this point, we didn't have a time to create new programs uh, because all our public service is teleworking and we needed to go fast. So we used the EI program and decided to expand its definition to include self-employed people, people that didn't have enough hours under EI, uh, parents that uh, had to deal with the fact that their children were home so wouldn't be able to work, and also uh, people that uh, had been diagnosed with COVID-19 had to stay home and people taking care of people that were sick. So that's what we decided to do. We created the CERB program, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, the $2,000 per month uh, program. Uh, and basically, you've heard a lot about it in the news. I can answer questions about it. And we've also increased the Canada Child Benefit and, and, and many other measures to make sure that we would put more money into people's pockets. 
And finally, we came up with our economic response and our economic package. And so we made sure to not only uh, help businesses have access to more liquidity by working with banks, uh, making sure also that people had access to uh, small and medium-sized businesses loans, a $40,000 loan. Um, and if you pay back in within two years, you can uh, keep $10,000. So it becomes a $10,000 subsidy. We would be uh, putting in place weight subsidies uh, uh, and I can answer questions about that. And finally, we would be making sure that people don't have to pay their taxes uh, right now. So we deferred payments of taxes, of GST, corporate taxes, and also custom duties. So these are all the measures we've taken. Uh, but obviously, uh, I know that there are still gaps and we're trying to mend them. Uh, but it is certainly my, uh, my pleasure and my responsibility to be in charge of the tourism sector and to defend the interests of the tourism sector. So I really hope that these measures are, are, are helping many of the businesses that are watching us or, and listening to us right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Minister. I think, I think it's quite astonishing how many um, different parachutes you, that your government has put out there for um, SMEs, for small, medium-sized enterprises, as well as you know the entrepreneurs out there that are uh, often just one person you know, businesses, especially yeah. in our industry and yeah. the, event, the event industry. I guess the, the question I'd have for you with all that is um, what advice do you give to uh, to those small businesses that are trying to take advantage of this? Uh, certainly the loan piece going to your own bank uh, makes a lot of sense. Are there other, are there, um, uh, you know, certain places to get all this information or where's the best place to point them, I suppose, to make sure that they are mm -hmm. um, well able to take advantage of it? So, if you haven't talked to your banker yet, you should be talking to your banker. And if your banker is not flexible, uh, we should know. So let Clark know, let Jennifer <laughs> Miguel know, because we need to make sure that our banks are actually providing the flexibility that they told us they would be providing. At the federal level, we decided to change some regulations to allow the, you know, the really the deployment of $300 billion worth of liquidity in our system through our banking sector. And so we've done that, but that was based on the deal that we've made with banks that they would be making sure to lower interest rates, uh, allow more uh, support to our SMEs, and also uh, you know, be much more willing to, uh, uh, for, for payments to be pushed a bit more uh, later in time. So we need to know that. So talk to your bank. Also, you can go on a website, which is the Canadian Business uh, Resilience Net Network, cbrn.ca. You'll have on that all the up-to-date information about uh, what are the federal measures and how we can help. The federal government and the Canadian Chamber of Commerce just made a, a deal to make sure that we would be providing that information on that website to date every day so that's very helpful and obviously also talking to your accountant uh, I used to be in business before being um, a, in politics and I understand that uh, in order to deal with risk uh, business owners entrepreneurs need to be able to assess uh, you know to, to not only assess risk but they need to have access to certainty and that's what we're trying to provide right now so please go ahead and get yourself informed because this is the best way to deal with what's happening right now. Yeah, thank you, Minister. And so, excellent. So so talk to your bankers, talk to your accountants. And yes, the, 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 joint, the joint partnership between the Canadian Chambers of Commerce and the federal government on the Resiliency Network is really worth looking at. I've really appreciated following um, the Canadian Chambers' work there and Perrin Beatty's leadership. So thank you for that support. Yep. Now, Minister, I'll just mm -hmm. ask a technical right. question. I, we can't see you, um, and you have a beautiful picture up, but uh, is your video on? Is it possible to turn your video on? Ah. I'll just leave it there. And Yes, um, I'm here. You're here? Okay. Then I'll just leave it to the smart technicians uh, in the studio to figure out whether or not we can get video back for the minister. Um, at least that's what I'm seeing. Um, so, so, minister, of course, I wanted to drill it into uh, more of the actual meetings industry that, that this group is, is largely part of. 
And certainly, um, I, my belief is that the, the business events um, that we can bring back to Canada can really stimulate um, activity, tourism activity, as well as economic uh, stimulation and activity. Um, so as, as you look at the broader tourism industry and the economic development hat that you now wear, um, are there um, stimulus or incentives or will the government be looking uh, at any way to support the growth and rebuilding of the business meetings industry? Of course. Uh, we know that um, the tourism industry has been very hard hit and that the recovery won't be easy because of social distancing measures. Um, at the beginning of this crisis a month ago, uh, the Minister of Finance, Bill Morneau, had indicated that there were two particular sectors that were deeply affected, oil and gas and uh, the tourism sector. So what we decided to do quickly was to use the EI sector, the EI program, and also our fiscal capacity to reach as many people as possible. We know we could reach 80% of businesses, but we had to work on, you know, and dealing with the 20% uh, cases left. Now, at this point, uh, we're dealing with that 20%, and that's why we're making changes by the minute. But also, we're trying to get to more specific sectors, which include the tourism sector. So we're having good conversations about that. About that, and when I'll have more information, Clark, obviously I'll. I'll, uh, I'll provide it to you and, and all your members and, and all the tourism sector. Wonderful. Well, we'll have you back on. Um, uh, yes, if no you, problem. So, if, I, if, I, I hope I that the video will be working. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's unfortunate, but that's okay. Um, yeah, we'll definitely invite you back. And, and this group certainly is, has been talking about how do we continue this conversation because just finishing, you know, Global Maze Industry Day does not end the crisis. We have a lot of work to do still. So, uh, so thank you for that, those comments, Minister. And I'm going to pin you on a bit of a more difficult one now. Um, the, uh, the business events industry, of course, conventions, exhibitions, incentive travel conferences, um, has largely been shut down. Obviously, we, we deal with groups of hundreds and thousands um, for our events. Um, so the, big, the, the really tough question is, when do you think the Government of Canada will again be able to support public gatherings of over 250 people? Uh, well, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what I know is that we'll be following the public health officials' um, recommendations. And that may vary also across the country because a lot of the provinces mm -hmm. are taking a lead on this. The spread of the virus is different in certain regions. Uh, certainly it's smaller, you know, it's, it, it's not the same in smaller towns and it is very concentrated in, in some hot spots in, in big cities. So at the end of the day, it all depends of, of how we can protect the, the capacity of our healthcare system and that we uh, do things in a way that there's no surges afterwards. So we are definitely seeing other countries uh, Asian countries in particular, some European countries. Uh, we're at the end of the spread of the virus uh, across the globe. We were the, you know, hit afterwards. Uh, and and so uh, the fact that we're able to look at other countries is helpful to see how they're dealing with their uh, economic recovery. But at the same time, you know, we want to make sure that uh, we we do things well and that we don't do things too quickly uh, and that could, you know, really um, wouldn't help in time because, as I said, the first priority is always to make sure that we can come back curve. And so if we right. reboot too quickly, well, if there's no vaccine and no treatment, there's a risk of us right. uh, not being able to contain the virus. Right. No, great answer. I mean, that, this is the biggest fear is that we actually see a recurrence or a, a COVID, you know, 20 or whatever it would be called uh, to follow up the <laughs> COVID-19. And we certainly don't want that to happen. So so we do um, we appreciate, uh, obviously, the what your government is doing to watch what's happening as other. Yeah, you're, as you say, other countries are, are trying different types of recovery models and, and we can learn from that. So thank you for thank you for handling that so diplomatically. Um, and so as we I just have one more question for you, Minister, and I know that you've got you've got another meeting, I think, coming up in about six minutes. So so just to wrap up, I guess, um, you know, as you as you think about the, the business 
um, meetings industry and, and the, you know, those entrepreneurs and the, the restaurants and the, the catering and the, the, you know, the decor groups and the AV companies and, and the venues and all this sort of thing that makes up um, our industry. I guess just mm -hmm. to leave it to you to what, what sort of is a, is your, is your um, message to them? What is your, what is your sort of, uh, uh, yeah, message to them as we, as we let you go now? Well, I think that uh, it's a message of hope. And uh, it's not only a message of hope, but it's confidence and trust in the future. A lot of our economy is based, yes, on direct input, direct data such as supply and, 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 and demand and, and sales. But even when you look at financial markets, a third of it is based on direct data. Two thirds of it is based on consumer confidence and, and, and emotions. So my message to everybody watching us and listening to us right now is keep the faith. Make sure that, uh, you know, we can work together to, to make sure that we will cross the bridge together and, and meet again also on, on, on the other shore. Um, things will get better. Uh, things will, will get brighter. We just need to pull each other together and uh, and make sure we can go through this very difficult time. But keeping an optimistic yeah. approach is the best, best thing we can, can do right now. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I, and it's it's yeah, it's a great comment on consumer confidence is so critical to an economy regenerating and coming coming back to life. So thank you for that that insight, Minister. And thank you for for thank joining you. us. Um, we we really appreciate with with all the all the work you're you're doing currently. Appreciate you joining us and look forward to a, a, again a further discussion in the future. We'd love to have you back with this group. Um, we know we're all in this together, and we look forward to your leadership as we move forward. Thank you, Minister. Keep it up, guys. Thank you. Okay. Um, so that was wonderful. Um, great to great to have that chance to hear from Minister Jolie, uh, such a critical uh, critical person for us in our industry. As we look at, as Meetings Being Business looks at advocacy uh, within the federal government, uh, Minister Jolie is a very, very key component of that and um, certainly important for us as we go forward. So now we shift gears again, and, and it's a real pleasure to bring together a panel uh, of extraordinary leaders in the business events industry here in Canada. And I hope we still have some of you from around the world uh, listening in, and, and please uh, please feel free to stay as we dive into some of the more um, more granular aspects of what's happening in our, in our industry, in our country, um, and where we might go in, in the recovery stage of it. So uh, it's, a, it's a been a real pleasure for me to get to know a number of these panelists, some of them over the last few years, some of them over the last few days, uh, honestly, and we haven't even met some of us. So, so um, we're looking forward to, again, the, the opportunity for us to come together uh, live in the future and, and truly uh, get to know each other um, better than we have so far. Um, so I want to just introduce the, the panel we have together for us here today, and, and then I'm going to jump into some questions and we'll go from there. So uh, many of you will know Chantelle sturk Nadu. The uh, Executive Director of Business Events at Destination Canada, she's with us. Heidi Welker, the past chair of Meetings Made Business Canada and the shoulders upon which I stand, wouldn't be here at all. None of us would be, I don't think, without Heidi and her great work uh, last year. Also Senior Vice President for Encore Canada. Laura Pallotta, Vice President of Sales and Distribution, the Marriott Hotels of Canada and the Vice Chair of Meetings Made Business Canada. Candace Sherling, uh, Director of National Sales at Tourism Saskatoon, is here with us. Betty Ann Shearer, the president of ProPlan Conferences and Events this year, and Tracy Folks Hansen, president and CEO of the Canadian Society of Association Executives. Thank you all for joining us here, and I think we can all see each other now on the, around, the, around the screen. Um, so, so let's jump right into the panel, um, and I will let you know before we get started, we, we, are, we are looking to, to go for a little about 30 minutes or maybe a little bit more than that, maybe 40 here. Um, and then we'll, we'll try to wrap up at least within 40 minutes. So just so you know um, where we're going here today. So at Meetings Made Business Canada, we declare that business events stimulate 34.7% of the tourism activity in Canada and importantly supports 229,000 jobs in our country. Uh, but sadly, that's not the case today, as we all know. Um, so as we start to unpack the, the ripple effect or the... Or the, the um, 
the knock-on effect of business events in Canada, uh, we wanted to look at a at how a cancellation uh, of an international event coming into Canada can impact the industry uh, acutely. So, so we're going to jump in with that frame, and I'm going to give each of the panelists a, a more specific question as we go. But let's look at how the uh, events industry and how a, how a cancellation of event, which we're seeing obviously significant numbers of, um, works its way through the industry. So, so panelists, if you're all ready, um, when a large event is cancelled, we're going to ask what the impact on the economy is and the industry. And I'm going to begin with Chantal. And Chantal, Destination Canada Business Events has been tracking the national business events activity um, for a while now. Does the national PACE report provide insights into the cancellations that we're experiencing in the industry and the impact of this loss? Yes, thanks, Clark. And uh, bonjour tout le monde. Merci d'avoir participé aujourd'hui. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Um, you know, I, I think an answer to this question is a little twofold for me. I think impacts of uh, events being canceled. When I look at the number of conventions and how 2020 was, was forecasting at the beginning of the year, uh, we were forecasting a very strong 2020 with over 1,700 business events in Canada, uh, representing more than a million delegates and half of them being international delegates. But as of April 6th, we all know what's been going on, and 40% of those conventions and business events have cancelled in 2020. This is a massive economic impact on our country, and this is one that has a 500 million loss in direct service in advance. So the impact of an international association conference can cancellation right now means that Canada goes back into that global rotation to host as Canada will only get that opportunity sometimes to bid every 5, 10, and 15 years. So that second loss that I'm going to be talking about is really looking at that future loss and the long-term impact of those numbers. So when several of our destination marketing organizations, our partners across the country that represent destinations, um, their funding is supported by a destination marketing fee or a tourism levy, levy that is collected through hotel rooms. And when an event is cancelled, a conference is cancelled, unoccupied hotel rooms mean that there's no DMF and no tourism levy. And usually that means that the, uh, the destination is, pulls themselves out of that marketing aspect of it and loses market presence that can now take years to recover. So really that twofold aspect is like a, like a, I would say, like a stone in a pond. The big splash is the immediate lost opportunity that cannot be recovered this year. And the ripple is the loss of the future opportunity that we've also lost for Canada. Thank you, Chantal. Yeah, that was, I mean, it's, it's, I know it's difficult to hear, but we all know we're going through it and it's, it's, um, it's important to understand it from a national point of view. I think a lot of our, our audience here will be spread across the country and maybe don't understand how this all happens from the top down. So thank you for that, Chantal. Um, and then Heidi, I want to turn to you and, and talk about the supply chain a little bit. Um, so as, you know, an event, major event is coming in, of course, the supply chain gets, gets uh, ramped up and ready for it. Um, then when it cancels, what does the trickle-down effect look like throughout the industry? Thanks, Clark. Yeah, there is a huge ripple effect on the supply chain. And when we talk about supply chain, we talk about hotels, we talk about convention centers, audiovisual companies, airlines, tour companies, restaurants, taxis and many, many others. And what's interesting for Canada is that business events, we are ranked number five out of 60 countries, the top fifth out of 60 countries that um, enjoys the privilege of hosting international, domestic and US events. So clearly the business events are very, very important to the Canadian economy. And with respect to Chantal's comment about the 40% of meetings being cancelled, mostly for 2020 that is, this represents a loss of some 520,000 delegates coming into our country. And it represents an economic impact of 438 to $500 million in direct spend. So Clark, if we were to include indirect spend, that number would significantly mm -hmm. right. increase. Right. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Heidi. Yeah, and we've, as we've been looking at uh, data um, from a meetings being business Canada point of view, it's it's quite, you know, this is we're talking about the the top number, the the direct spend, but there's a 
huge, huge trickle on effect um, that goes throughout throughout very many small businesses that we don't even think about, perhaps. Uh, but on the on the big big side of it, of course, is hotels. And and Laura, obviously, hotels are are significantly impacted right now. Um, and so when you when you think about a cancellation in today's world, um, you know what do, what is the impact on on the Marriott and and where does it how does that trickle through the organization? Thanks very much, Clark, and uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. I'm very pleased to be addressing you. Um, I will say, you know, the impact to our hotel and the neighborhood in which we work and all of our stakeholders is really enormous. Um, in terms of our associates, our housekeepers, our front desk, security, our restaurants, including our in-room dining folks, engineering, all of these people lose hours. Um, our suppliers and our partners and then in the local neighborhood, uh, these people all lose the opportunity to capture customers um, doing runs in terms of transportation, vis visiting their restaurants and then going and enjoying their attractions. And then also in terms of our other stakeholders, um, of course, uh, our hotel owners who, um, you know, are, are still are, have to manage um, and pay management and hourly wages, uh, maintain hotel operations, safety and security, um, they lose out and they have to really dig deep to be able to manage. And of course, even to Marriott, we, we don't own our hotels, but we collect fees uh, from revenues um, that, de that are derived. So. All of this uh, really is tantamount to a huge impact. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for unpacking that, Laura. You know, when you think about the neighborhood around a hotel or a convention center, you know, as in Calgary, the Stephen Avenue, the, the impact they have when when those events are there is so positive, but when they're not, certainly certainly negative. And and Candice, as we as we um, talk about jurisdiction and and more specifically, pedestrian organizing like tourism, Saskatoon, how how do you how do you feel that cancellation, I guess, as, as a community or as a, as a city? Thank you, Clark, and, and thanks to all my colleagues for, for getting together to share this information um, around the globe today. Um, as you have heard, it's a, it's a huge impact on all levels and, and to the community. Um, we have a very recent example of this in Saskatoon, which was the cancellation of the Junos uh, days before it was, it was set to happen. And obviously the financial implications uh, for the community are huge. We no longer have that economic impact coming in. Um, it's a financial um, burden and implication for the association itself, for our province, for our city, and of course for the community with all the work and effort that they put into to preparing for this event. For the Juno specifically, we had already trained 450 volunteers, 150 drivers, hours of work put in by the host committee to really um, gather the community. And then of course there's the socioeconomic impact as well. The culture of of having something like the Junos in your city, um, the pride of hosting, the excitement, of course, it was deflating for our city. Now, that said, with a resilient community, you know, some of the products that were produced to go along with the Junos were used to give back and, and give back to um, places of need within our community. So our community was able to come together, but it was a devastating loss for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's... Um... I can only imagine, and the you know, of course, the the volunteer part we we often forget about it. How how the volunteering at an event is so important for so many of our of our uh, community community members. So so thank you for that for that, Candice. Um, and Betty Ann, uh, turning to you now, I've heard you refer to a cancellation of an event as as a house of cards. Can you unpack that uh, that viewpoint for us a little bit? Yes, of course. Thank you, Clark, and um, thank you for inviting me to this important conversation. Absolutely. Um, as as Heidi mentioned, you know our supply chains are greatly affected. But as an entrepreneur and as a meeting planner, I found myself at ground zero, affected overnight, and my business affected overnight. Um, so certainly, the professional event team is is affected immediately, and in some cases, um, association management companies as well. Next are speaker bureaus and professional speakers who immediately lose their contracts in a cancellation. Audiovisual and production services. In a scale of event, that alone can represent a hundred of professional um, event people. Um, entertainment agents, musicians, and performers will all lose their gigs. Professional decorators, prop houses, and rental agencies also affected. 
first and growers are affected. Show services, contractors, and also expo freight management. Think of the number of trucks that are on the road daily servicing our industry. Printers and signage providers, premium and swag suppliers, awards and gift companies are also affected. Security companies, and then transportation, as Heidi again mentioned, not just the airlines and, and trains, but our ground transport that supports our events, buses, taxi, and Uber drivers. Destination management companies, another group that would be strongly affected, and of course, all the offsite venues that we utilize in the experience design that we're so passionate about. Literally, thousands of jobs can be affected by the cancellation of just one large event. Yeah, it, it's really, really incredible, Betty Ann, to hear that because you start to, you know, you start to think through the whole industry and how integrated the supply chain is and how tight it is. Uh, the impact is just incredible. So, thank you for that. And and Tracy. Um, you know, if, if an event is an association convention, as the large ones often are that we host, uh, what, what impact does a cancellation have on the association itself? Tracy, I think you're muted if you are speaking. I'm not hearing you. Ta-da, I knew it would be me. Uh, thanks, Clark. <laughs> and I wanted to thank um, Meetings Mean Business Canada for hosting um, this really important discussion. Uh, we've already heard from the panel that the spin-off effects uh, are massive, and they are certainly felt across communities and industries from coast to coast to coast. And associations are certainly not immune to COVID-19, nor are we immune to the toll that it's taking, be it economic or otherwise. After all, we, you know, we rely on events, uh, conferences, meetings for critical revenue um, for associations. That revenue comes from registration fees and sponsorships and trade shows and exhibits. The list goes on. We recently surveyed CSAE members thanks to Bram Research uh, Inc. Uh, the survey was in field from March 20th to 25th. That's how recent it is. And at that time, 66% of respondents let us know that they had already canceled or delayed in-person member education, which is a fundamental piece of associations. And almost 60% had actually canceled or delayed their conference. 56% of those organizations that had actually canceled events due to COVID-19 have already indicated a loss in revenue from, from these cancellations. So it's not just the revenue that comes directly from the event, but the lost revenue then further impacts the association. Right. Um, it puts more pressure on them to scale back their activities. Uh, they may have to reduce staffing. And in some cases, in a lot of cases, the viability of the association is threatened and at risk. Yeah, it's it's incredible. I, you know, a lot of so many associations, as you say, Tracy, are so so tied to their annual or, or biannual or semi-annual event that it is critical. So it's another another flag to be aware of as we as we um, look forward. Thank you all for those great insights. Uh, you know, as you unpack this, there's so much there's so much that this uh, large event canceling one large event canceling impacts. And right now, obviously, as Chantel explained earlier, we're experiencing many, many more than one uh, right now. Um, so as we experience these unprecedented cancellations and postponements, of course, we know that also we're not in control of, of the travel and gathering restrictions and, and what is actually causing these impacts. Uh, nor do we know how long uh, it'll take, it'll last, or will, it'll be before we can get back to our, our new normal. But but, um, but let me turn that page and let's look forward a bit. And when we are once again open for business here in Canada, um, the, then the question is, what is what will it take to bring business events and the industry back to where we were in 2019? Um, and Chantelle, I'll come back to you again. You, you lead the group that makes that, that markets Canada to the world for business events uh, at Destination Canada. How do you envisage Team Canada post COVID-19 how will we respond as a country? Well, I think we will look very different, um, but it will be our, our industry's ability to really pivot, to be nimble and work together, um, like we're doing right now through this response. Um, the recovery phase is going to be taking us to that uh, continued uh, flexibility. Um, we also anticipate that several of our Canadian uh, partners will actually be making a dramatic shift in their investments 
and really focus back on rebuilding and uh, rebounding the Canadian domestic market. So making sure that they're re-stimulating the corporate, uh, corporate meetings, the incentives that are going across Canada itself, as well as the associations that are still around that have that ability to um, reinvest, to want to make sure that they're getting their investment back and re-educate. Um, and with that shift of our partners going uh, more on the domestic, um, that leaves us in this role that we really may need to be focusing our attention back into those international markets if some of them are pulling out of that, those markets. And that um, really, I would say that be complementing the work that our partners have already been doing and can hopefully continue mm -hmm. to do. But um, we really want to be um, focusing and leveraging on our economic sector strategy. So for those who don't know what that means, it really is attracting business events to Canada that are aligned with our Government of Canada's economic priority sectors. And that means for us to be going after business um, and sectors, uh, global meetings and, and conventions that are within those sectors that have remained strong through this crisis. So it's really evaluating which sectors are doing well and making sure that we bring them back into Canada in the future to help that long-term success, not just for the business events, but our overall economy to re-stimulate it, um, perhaps even with the investment and the trade component, so that business events really become that catalyst to help regrow our economy um, through those priority sectors. Yeah, thanks, Chantal, and I really love the, the the focus you're given to you're giving to industry as we go and hunt these events, having you know making it relevant to the market that they're coming into, and and the fact that you guys look at the the, the Canadian landscape to look for those areas of speciality or expertise to bring the right events into the right locations to drive economic impact, I think is is brilliant, and you guys are doing a great job of that, and and it sounds like that will be part of our secret sauce is Canada as we come out of this and, and look towards the future. So thank you, Chantel. Um, so Candice, um, uh, do you agree with Chantel's perspective? Will, will tourism Saskatoon be doing anything unique or different to the Team Canada approach or does this all make sense from your perspective as well? It definitely makes sense for the international markets and, and definitely looking uh, more domestic uh, right now. Travel is typically resilient and uh, right now we're ethically bound to ensure that travel is safe and that our community is safe to bring people into our community. Um, and we need to communicate that out, um, out to our partners um, and out to our clients. Um, developing investment dollars for marketing right now is crucial. Um, and we really need to focus on keeping our momentum and pride of place with our local community um, and, and educate our local community on how this industry, the meetings and convents industry, uh, can help rebuild our economy and, uh, and what it would take to you know, teach them how to host at home and really communicate out uh, the benefits of, of hosting events here on a local level. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think we're going to see that be the first thing that starts to come back as people feel comfortable getting out of their house and maybe going going into the cities a bit more. Um, and, and Laura, over to you. And obviously, Marriott being the largest hotel brand, global marketing and sales team, sales team out there. Um, after a situation like this, is there a bit of a feeding frenzy or a heavy competition internally? And how, how do you, as a senior manager within Marriott, um, help manage this for the, uh, the Marriott brand? Well, as my colleagues have already mentioned, uh, Clark, it's going to take this village, uh, everybody working together um, to really focus on, you know, the business that comes back first and then comes back next and on and on. Um, I love what Ms. Minister Jolie said, in fact, in terms around instilling confidence. Um, we do have to instill that confidence. It starts with us as leaders. Uh, we, although this is highly emotional, um, we've all been impacted in very many ways. We're very worried about our associates. Um, we need to have a cool head and these are unprecedented times. Uh, we need to be calm. We need to try as best we can to remove that emotion so that we can strategize um, effectively. Um, so I think that really means, you know, uh, working across segments, partnering to win the business, focusing on, as Chantel mentioned, the sector strategy. That's an excellent plan that we should all be leveraging. Um, I, I will also say we need to learn from past mistakes at SARS and others where 
uh, we all started to deeply discount and, and deeply discounting does not create demand. We have spent very many years building up our value uh, in every market in Canada. We provide value from Vancouver to Halifax. Um, so we need to make sure that we do do that um, and be smart uh, about that as we as we pull ourselves out from that. And then just finally, tactically, I would say um, we have been known, our brand in Canada has been built on safety and security and welcoming. Uh, I think we should leverage that even more now. Um, I think we do need to work with government uh, and think about are there tax incentives that we perhaps can help pull across to our customers. Uh, and then also, of course, as you mentioned at the beginning, it's, it's marketing. It's the right market message at the right time to the right customer. So lots to do, but I'm absolutely confident that this group can do it. Great. No, thanks, Laura. I, and I agree. And I think we learned so much coming out of SARS. We're going to learn a lot coming out of COVID-19 as well. And and it will come down to us, us, um, you know, communicating together, being together as, as a as a cross Canada, you know, team, all of us, and um, and uh, obviously advocating to the to the powers that be and the and the the uh, government to support this as well, both federally and provincially, and even municipality municipally, I think so. Um, so, so Tracy, uh, turning back to associations, how will the association world reset and how will we bring association business back uh, to Canada from your perspective? I think for starters, uh, Laura was bang on when, when she said it's going to take all of us and a whole meeting of the minds. Associations are already a formed collective. They have the power and the strength of very vast networks. And that's a really good thing that will help carry through. Uh, that said, we've already estimated that the immediate loss to associations due to this pandemic is about $156 million in total revenue, and that's with unanticipated effects yet to be known. So those were early day findings. That really sort of changes everything. It changes the landscape. We know uh, that in-person events create uh, revenue, builds loyalty, provides um, uh, connection. It's a vital part of the association sector. So building a new industry, because I think that's really what we're talking about, is going to take innovation and vision and collaboration for sure and patience and, and, a, and a lot of kindness. The harsh reality is large gatherings are not likely to be at the top of the list when restrictions are eased. So we need to really work together to bring forward solutions um, and, and, and a willingness to envision and build out what a new future would, will be so that we bridge in the interim and, and we come out the other side of this with a much stronger, um, much stronger, much more viable uh, meetings and, and event industry uh, that serves all of us. Hmm. Yeah, no, thank you, Tracy. I think that's very insightful. And I think working together, partnerships obviously are such a, a critical part, will be a critical part of our recovery going forward. Um, and so, Betty Ann, um, you know, how do you think that entrepreneurs will become creative or how do you think they'll rethink the world? Um, as we, they may be the most nimble of us all, um, as we recover and shift to a new normal, how do you think they'll respond? Well, first of all, Clark, I wanna say how, how proud I am to be Canadian. To watch all levels of our government react the way that they have over the last month really speaks to who, you know, what our citizenship is and who we are as, as people. Um, we need to see the continued economic stimulus investment, especially for our solopreneurs who are highly skilled event professionals and creative um, innovators. You're right, Clark. We're, we're the ones that are nimble. We're the ones that can react um, quickly. And so we're actually the segment that we should all be watching when it comes to signs of recovery. Currently, self-employed entrepreneurs make up the fastest growing segment of our workforce, and this is highly evident in our industry. I know that following SARS, we saw many furloughed or displaced event professionals become self-employed, creating more competition, certainly in the marketplace, but also a lot more opportunity. So support of this industry segment is critical. Collaboration is key. There are many interdependent and moving parts for our industry, and we need to work together to be su supportive of even the smallest of businesses. If we are asking our government to back us, we need to back each other. 
one of the most um, inspiring things I heard Minister Jolie say was her access to certainty. And, and I know that as a business owner, I have felt this, and it is what makes me hopeful for the future. That's great. That's great. Thank, thank you, Betty. And, and I, I agree. I mean, seeing our seeing levels of government work together are is really uh, inspiring for us. But we, we need to take that as a cue and then and, and lead as well as, as Laura has said to in, in this group, you know, truly becoming, um, you know, together, coming together to lead uh, us out of this is important. Um, so, so Heidi, you've been in the, the AV and event production business for much of your career. And, and what do you think the supplier community will do? Uh, how will they respond to support the industry coming back to life? Well, first and foremost, I have to totally agree with everything that's been said um, just a moment ago. And I, too, am very proud to be Canadian. I, too, am very proud of our health care system. Um, I think we are an example moving forward, not just uh, from a government perspective, but also from an industry perspective. So, but I will say that first and foremost, we have to continue to distance ourselves for now until we flatten and see the downward uh, motion of the curve. And there will be measurements um, and controls in place for us to start congregating again. That said, we are all in this together and we are a very resilient bunch as we've proven. Um, and we are business event strategists, so it will take some time, but together as an industry, we will get through this. And as part of the supply chain, um, I truly feel that the supply chain partners have a responsibility to work with Business Events Canada, to work with the convention centers, convention centers of Canada, our venues, and our entrepreneurs and our customers to help get the business back on track because we know as part of the supply chain that if the business is growing that we will be able to participate in that opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Heidi. And and again, I agree. Uh, great comments all. And, and obviously, the more we're together on, on the recovery, the, the, the stronger it will be for sure. So uh, turning to, we're, we're coming down to the, to the bottom of the hour here, and I want to make sure I I move through the next uh, couple questions quite quickly over the next, uh, say, 15 minutes. But um, so, question three, and I'll just I'll go to the table when we're when we're done here. But when thinking about uh, what is going to look like when it comes back, I guess the question is, what do you wonder about? What do you wonder if? Um, and Heidi, I'm going to come right back to you and start with you. What do you wonder about? I wonder about the stages that we'll go through before we are once again a robust industry. Um, I heard the other day that Lufthansa is retiring, retiring some of its fleet, as they say it will take years for travel to rebound. So that makes me wonder about what the new normal will be and what will it look like? How will technology play a role in the new normal? I also wonder how the business events strategist role will change from an entrepreneur, partner, meeting professional, et cetera, all the different perspectives. And finally, I wonder how or if corporations and nonprofit business models will change. So it'll be interesting to see what the future brings. Yeah, absolutely. And the whole concept of a gig economy starts to starts to take shape as you come out of that that thinking, Heidi. Thank you. And uh, Betty Ann, what do you wonder about? Well, Clark, at a time when the industry is embracing and consuming technology like mm -hmm. never before. Uh, to pivot to virtual events, I actually find myself thinking about the bigger picture. Um, how will organizations, our, our clients, be impacted by their required move to virtual platforms for day-to-day -day operation, operations? Um, many have now invested in cloud-based and project management software. So will working remotely truly become the norm for our clients? Um, I find myself wondering if the conversations that CFOs will be having with their boards will be, will they be asking, does it make sense to spend tens of thousands of dollars a month on rent? Um, and if so, how would this affect events? Um, I think the need to gather to ensure employee connection and fostering of culture becomes more important than ever before. Most likely, we're going to see many more smaller, more regional meetings. And in that, 
being the entrepreneur, being the optimist, I see the potential for event portfolio growth. Excellent. Good. Optimism. We, I like that. I like that for sure, Betty. And thank you for that. Um, and I don't disagree with you. I think, I think, yeah, rapidly uh, smaller size events, regionalized, uh, could be the first thing we start to see. Um, and, and Laura, back to you on the on the hotel front. And and you, you know, you uh, have so many assets across the country that are largely um, are very very largely empty now. Um, you know, what do you wonder about as this starts to come back uh, from your business perspective? Well, you know, Clark, the team at Marriott uh, globally is thinking about that every day yeah. right now. Uh, yeah. You know, how are we going to operationalize the needs of our customers? Uh, what does it mean? You know, what are meeting setups look like in the future? How do we yeah. serve food yeah. and beverage? All those things that are so yeah. important part of meeting experience. Um, you know, and what does technology uh, look like, as Heidi mentioned, um, and how do we do that most effectively, effectively without ever replacing the need to meet face to face, right? That is still the most powerful and that the evidence uh, and the data certainly is still telling us that. Um, you know, what we're thinking about right now is um, how do we really leverage what we've learned over the last four or five weeks in terms of people and their, you know, their most important needs being local, you know, touching people, um, spending time together, you know, enjoying food and beverage experiences, making. So I think local is going to be a big part of this theme. Um, I also think that um, we've also demonstrated that the, um, you know, the increased um, partnership with government at all levels uh, is very, very important. So I think increasingly, um, I think we, as we build bridges and new relationships with uh, with our government folks, um, we're going to really have to work even closer together with them um, so that we get this all right. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks, Laura. Um, I totally agree. And and Candice, what are you, what are you wondering about? I think right now, globally, everybody will be a lot more prepared for something like this uh, to come in the future. The changes in healthcare, our response will be a lot more quick and aggressive, which will be to everyone's benefit. I, I believe that uh, destinations and tourism bureaus will become a more trusted source of guidance uh, for our own communities and for the business events. Um, there is strength in crisis, and I wonder what types of really cool and unique initiatives and collaborations are going to come out of this and looking at the different ways that we'll be doing business. And, you know, it's, it's in that sense, it's really exciting to think about what could be created um, through crisis and, and coming together globally um, and not just as a country. I also do wonder how this is going to change the sharing economy. You know, our friends in the hotel world, um, what type of new standards are going to be coming in and really looking at safety and cleanliness and those types of standards, how will this affect the sharing economy and, and perhaps it'll drive people to hotels more, which would be really great. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Candice. Absolutely. It'll be it'll be a different world and it'll be it'll be interesting to see how venues and facilities actually manage that safely. Uh, and Tracy, what are you wondering about? So I think I, I heard a few times people saying how proud they are to be Canadians. And and I loved it when the minister said that we have to have faith. And I think Canadians inherently have faith and we have an incredibly beautiful country. So if road trips are the new norm uh, and visiting visiting every province and territory in the next short while um, or longer term is really, really an incredible thought and journey personally. Um, I, uh, I wonder about how adaptable and flexible we are. We are human beings, after all, to build something new. And I, I agree um, with Candace that I, I think that there's some really great things that come out of um, challenges, opportunities uh, really come forward, and that whole sense of innovation and how do we think differently um, and what does that look like. I think we need to recognize that the, the industry is changing, but the world is changing, and we're all going to be changed as a result of it. Um, and, and then how do we how do we embrace that change as human beings who often hold very tight to what once was? Um, and how do we come together? And I think there's there's this really great, um, somebody said it earlier that it takes a village. How do we come together and stay together um, to create something new in a really collaborative and collective way? I think that's what it's going to take um, to get us through this. And I hope that we can embrace that and carry it forward into a new way of doing business into the future. 
Yeah, great. Thank you, Tracy. I, I agree. I think it's going to be a whole, a whole new world out there uh, for sure. And Chantel, the, the, the last uh, respondents to this one, what are you, uh, what are you wondering about? Well, I think part of it is that, uh, you know, what remains to be seen is how long it will actually take for international business travelers um, to come to Canada, back to Canada. Um, you know, reading several different surveys from three to six months all the way up to 18 months to 24. Uh, so I think, you know, when we're talking about pent up demand, you know, there's the leisure visitor, there's uh, the business events themselves. I think we all need to really get a, a deep understanding of the difference between the two. Um, I think as suppliers, I think we will all need to be much more focused and better understand our new audience and ensure our message is relevant. I don't think we can go out and do our marketing or our sales the same way anymore. Um, I also think that clients um, may be more inclined to booking in destinations that are aligned with their own corporate values now. So if they're going to be meeting, I want to be, they want to be meeting uh, for a purpose. And really, that's where I think those corporate values come into play, whether, uh, you know, sustainable, social, economic alignment with what their organization uh, corporately or association belongs to or believes in, so that they're bringing value back to their stakeholders or their members of that association. Um, and I also think there, there will be a shift, um, you know, a strategic shift with, with technology, all the digital tools. So everything that we're learning right now, that that will really come into play. But I think that, um, you know, we, we can't forget and we, we know that we are all social animals. And so we all crave that face to face meeting and the networking and the connection between people as much as technology is wonderful. So I still think and I believe and that's the hope side, perhaps, or the optimistic side. But live meetings will still um, be uh, very important and continue but I think it's going to be alongside virtual technology. So it's ensuring that when they're trying to get more members or more attendees at their conference, that might look differently um, where uh, you know, a large contend contingency might be from a technology perspective as well as in person. So that's kind of the things that, I, that keeps me up at night. Yeah, <laughs> that's great, Chantel. And I, I love the thought that you know, uh, PCOs and, and the planners that might come might bring groups in will look more more um, strictly at where they're going for a different purpose, a social purpose, uh, whatever that might look like to fit the culture of the organization. Because I think we were seeing that even before the COVID-19 crisis, as you start to look at the values of a location, start to weigh in significantly to decisions, uh, it sounds like that will accelerate. So um, I'm going to go to the, the final question, and I've got about three minutes to get through it. So I'm going to try to get you guys to do rapid fire as best I can so I can wrap us up and get us uh, moving on to the rest of the day. But um, just a very quick uh, snippet, if I may. Um, and what message would you like to send our colleagues today? Laura? Well, one of our speakers said it earlier, and it really resonated with me, Clark, um, when he said, we stand together right now uh, while we're all apart. Um, when I think about my associates across the country, uh, I want you to know that the entire leadership team, we are all thinking about you every day. We are doing everything we possibly can to work with ownership and others to make sure um, that you have what you need to manage. So we're constantly, it's on, all in our thoughts. Awesome, thanks Laura. And Candice? Two very simple words, Clark, hold fast. Hold fast together, we can get through this. Do not let go of the rope. We are all tied together in this and we will get through it together. So just keep the faith. Awesome, thanks Candice. Betty Ann, how about you? I think the most important thing I'd like to say to my fellow um, meeting and event planners is don't forget who you are. Event planners have the privilege and the responsibility of major influence in the industry. And I would stress two areas where I think we have significant impact and can bring leadership. First of all, again, to our supply chain protection. It's more important than ever to look from this perspective. For years, we have embraced the concept of farm to table, but now it is more important to ask bigger questions than where the chef get his broccoli. We need to ask, you know, where do you get your staff uniforms? Where do you source your, mins, your dishes, your cleaning supplies, um, right through all of our supply chains? And secondly, and probably even important, 
is the question of sustainability. We've been granted a bit of a reset environmentally, and we are seeing this in China and India, where we've been amazed at the signs of recovery of our planet. Now more than ever, planners need to consider sustainable principles in the planning and delivery of events. Excellent. Thank you, Betty Ann. And Tracy, your thoughts. Uh, thanks, Clark. I think um, the thing that I would say is, uh, and it may sound strange, but associations are more important than ever during a crisis. We are perfectly positioned for collective problem solving. Associations are represent businesses, trades, uh, professionals, special interest groups. So we can use that collective strength to create solutions as we go forward. Uh, I think that our established and expansive association networks will play a, a critical role in the recovery of uh, Canada's economy and certainly future development as we go forward. The sector is filled with incredibly talented leaders, both experienced and emerging. Um, and all of those folks will bring together innovation and support um, to the meeting and event industry. And that's how we connect and that's where we stay connected so that we can continue to develop uh, solutions together to build what, in my opinion, I, is a brand new world that connects us um, and, and brings us together once again. Great. Thank you, Tracy. And Chantel, a thought for our colleagues out there. Yeah, just a few, and, and I think one really is that um, we can't make assumptions moving forward. We can't make assumptions about who our audience or our clients are or what our industry segment will look like um, because of the, these moving parts right now. I think more than ever, we can control now also if the audience and the industry is changing, what are we doing differently to respond and stay resilient to get through this? You know, this is a chance to reset, as we talked about, rethink and reboot. We know that our, our industry knows how to celebrate and we've had great times. We've also know very much how to weather the bad times. And so I think we may be physically distanced as we've all talked about, we've never been more connected, but I think it's the spirit of this teamwork and the support for one another that will help us get through this. And on a personal note, I think uh, for those of you that know um, our Canada brand, it's Canada for Glowing Hearts. And what a, what a time to be thinking about this. And mine personally has been glowing through this, this process right now as uh, those that have been impacted and affected from COVID. Um, but it also is glowing for hope. And it really is showing that our industry works really well together and it's resilient um, as Canadian proud, uh, proud Canadians that we all are, we'll get through this together. So that's my last mark. Wonderful. Merci. Thank you, Chantel. And I, yeah, and I totally, I love that brand. It's it's fantastic. And Heidi, uh, I'm going to give you the last word, the last shout out here to uh, to our colleagues out there. Um, what do you want to say to them? I think what I'd want, I've just three things, um, and this is where the emotional side of me comes in. But we will all get through this. We will all get through this. We are a social economy, so face-to-face -face meetings are part of our DNA. And um, to the virtual audience and to all of you that are um, on this call today, I can't wait to give my hugs to each and every one of you. Awesome. Thank you, Heidi. Um, and, and thank you all for taking time to join us for this really thoughtful and important panel. I thank all the, all the panelists, of course, and I hope we can do it again very soon. We've already talked about that. That we'd love to do it again so i'm sure we will but um as we've heard here there's there's been a seismic impact on the canadian business events industry in fact there's been a tremendous impact on the entire economy of, of of canada as we know so as we move forward from today the questions will not the question is not will we recover from COVID 19 and its impact on our industry the real question is what will the recovery look like um and when will it begin to happen i realize i'm stating the obvious but i I will leave you with the thought that as an industry, we must plan for the recovery now and use the time we have to be strategic, both from an industry point of view, as well as from our own businesses point of view. It's critical that we each look internally at our businesses and organizations and make sure that our recovery strategy is sound, well-developed and achievable. This, this thinking may require us to consider new partnerships, joint ventures, strategic alliances that we may not have considered in the past. I, I encourage you to think about how your business will recover, consult with your supply chain, both your clients and your suppliers, and be creative in your new view of collaboration.
Meetings Me Business Canada is here to support you where we can, and we continue to advocate for the industry and its importance to the economic catalyst for recovery. My thanks to Minister Jolie for joining us earlier in the event and to each of the esteemed panelists for providing such great insights and commentary uh, on the state of the business events industry today and where we'll be going tomorrow. But before I sign off, I really want to thank some of the people who have made this event happen here in Canada. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about Anne Nguyen and her, her, her tweet that made this happen. And uh, she's done, she's did that, but then she didn't just tweet and walk away. She's been doing tremendous amount of work to make this all come together. So uh, let's all give her a round of applause from wherever we are <laughs> around the country. Um, and then, of course, two of the board members of Meetings and Business Canada, which are, are just so, so important to us to our family inside of the board at, at MMBC. Jennifer Spear and, and Debbie Van Der Beek have both been fantastic support as well in pulling this together either in front of the camera or behind the scenes. Um, tireless work for, by these ladies that, that if they hadn't done that, we would not be together today. Um, so really my thanks to all three of you uh, for doing such an outstanding job uh, today, but for the last month as well. Um, this community will continue to meet, and we look forward to, to doing that. Um, we, we want to, this group here. Uh, we've talked about that. Uh, for you, in order to engage with us, and perhaps if you haven't already, but join the Meetings Mean Business Canada group on LinkedIn. Um, it's, a, it's a good place for us to share thoughts, share ideas, and post things that, that can support the industry across the country. So, so with that, I will say stay well, stay strong, and stay together. Thanks, everybody. You look so fine So darling, please don't mind I fell in love maybe once or twice But you, you look so fine You are the sunshine in my life Will you come